see a perfect point in it. Traditional metal mirrors have been made. This is what I call the delta bronze alloy. village of Aranmula. In front of this lovely Aranmula Parthasati temple, at least I think a 400 years old temple. And in fact the Raja of Aranmula is said to have hired these craftsmen from Tamil Nadu. And they say that they, this alloy proportion which is used to make the Aranmula famous Aranmula metal mirror or Balkanari is something which uh, they discovered due to the grace of the goddess who blessed them and this alloy proportion came to a widow called Parvati Amman in the So this Aranmula temple is very much interwoven with the myths of the, of, of, uh, the um, making of the Aranmula temple. It's a temple dedicated to Krishna. This is a spectacular temple, wonderful wooden edifice of the Aranmula temple. With painted ceiling and lovely woodwork, typical Kerala style architecture and rulers, the chair, chair rulers, and you can see that it's a mix of wooden architecture and sculpture and some sculpted panels also along here, and a typical Kerala ruler. And you see here this boat-shaped roof, and of course the boat-shaped roof reminds me of the fact that Aranmula, which is located by the river Pampa, is very famous for the snake boat festival where a large number of uh, canoe type boats are uh, they call snake boats and they're taken out along this uh, the backwaters here the pampa river actually in this case and it's it's a wonderful festival that's there at the time of september where they all have these boat races so this is the way leading to the river <laughs> Very scenic spot. You have the river Pampa flowing on the side, 
and this lovely temple gateway up here made of wood We are here in Aranmula, which is in Kerala, um, a little village where traditional metal mirrors have been made for at least the past 200 years as far as we know. These are made of a higher tin content bronze, bronze with about 33% tin which I studied and analyzed. So here we are seeing how they actually cast this alloy into a mirror blank which is then really polished very finely. This is what I call a delta bronze alloy. It has 33% tin in bronze and this I found out by microstructural and uh, uh, SEM analysis. And this alloy is chosen because as you can see it's a very silvery white color and although it's a very brittle metal, they cast it in a very special way so that a very thin blank is cast of a homogeneous alloy so that it won't break more easily. As you can see actually it is very brittle, I can just break it with a hammer or if I just do, see it breaks, it's a very brittle alloy. So the real challenge for them is to cast a very thin blank of the silvery alloy. These disc molds are rough clay disc molds, then they apply a very fine clay layer made of ground pottery on it so that it gives a finer finish and then finally he applies a layer of charcoal so that you get the finest surface possible against which the mirror blank is cast. Then these two disc molds will be placed together and tiny pieces of spacers are kept to maintain the hollow between the disc molds and then it is encased in clay so that it forms an encasement like this with clay. And then this encased clay mold is then they, they make a little channel, a wax channel and then this is the mouth here. This forms both a crucible and a mold. The top part is the crucible cup and this is the mold. So then they will put the metal to be cast here with the channel connecting it and cover it and then they will heat it in the reverse process so that the metal gets molten. They will tip it over so that it forms the blank. So we are watching all of these various processes. We begin with asking him to show us how to do the final polishing. So you see here, this is the first layer of ground pottery which is applied as a slip onto this uh, disc mold for making the mirror which is just done by a simple polishing process on this stone anvil. This is how he is putting the charcoal. First he had used pottery over there, the final layer of pottery was there and that is finished with pottery and now this is charcoal. You can even sponge it back into either in the pottery in this side or right? That is on the side he put the pottery, uh, the, the powder made of pottery on the side. So you see it's a very fine slip which is applied on the surface of the mold. And using charcoal makes sense because charcoal will absorb the gases so that you get a very fine blank for the mirror which is absolutely flawless. Now we see how he's putting the spacers. He puts these small metal spacers at the three corners and then he covers it with the other mold. That will define the thickness of the blank. Then he puts a little wax uh, tub which will form the channel. Then he will cover it with this clay which is taken from the paddy field. So that the two disc molds are now be completely encased in clay. And as I mentioned, I've also published in the uh, Encyclopedia of Non-Western Science about this extraordinary mineral. This fine grade of clay was made by crushing pottery. And this anvil here is used to, to grind the clay.
And what is interesting about this Aran Mula mirror making tradition is that using very low cost techniques and very low cost materials like clay, cow dung, burnt bricks, and of course the cost of the metal is the most obviously. Using very simple and low tech techniques, a rather sophisticated high tech product, end product is, is made available in the form of this uh, delta bronze alloy which I was mentioning, uh, which is a specular alloy which is used for making the mirror. So it's, it's really the celebration of low cost materials which are all in a way recyclable also. So it's an eco-friendly product in a way. And these mirrors were used as the um, Ashtamangalyam set in, in the Kerala Nair family especially where the bride would receive a metal mirror as part of the um, wedding too so. So here he has completed covering two of these lists with this fine potty space and you can see here that he's left a wax channel and this will be pre-fired once and the wax will be melted out so that the crucible cup can be made and the metal can be poured in. Now he will show us the next stage of how the uh, cup is made. Here he has already made two cups but he will demonstrate to us how that's done. The entire process in the, is in the hands of the skills of the craftsman. It's a handmade technique. Then he makes a hole in the cup and then he very skill, skillfully widens it out so that the mouth of the crucible cup is formed. So I've described this as a process of crucible cup mold casting process. That's of course showing you how the base ground. And here our cup is widening out. And here you see how he's putting this pottery. And he's showing us how he's putting this, this layer of pottery on it. So this mix from fine ground pottery, he is applying. Now he is now applying more clay on this. Uh, as you saw these two processes with this mold being made here with a slip and then putting in putting the mold here inside and he's also making a hole here for the gases to escape inside that because that hole is very crucial for the gases to escape because otherwise the trapped gases will spoil the casting form bubbles. I must explain this. Yeah. This mold actually broke because it was heated for too long. We were waiting for Balaji to film and so the mold, the cup of the mold was kept in the heart for too long. But what happened, it became very brittle. So that's why the temperature has to be just right. If it's too hot, then it breaks. Now we've got to repair this mold. And it's like almost like glass hardness becomes very refractory. Mm -hmm. You said the temperature reaches 800, so very hard and refractory. Mm -hmm.
Slowly tipped it over. Then he closes that hole.
She says some of them will spoil. So he says that out of all of them won't turn out well. Some will, some won't. This process is that nothing is wasted and everything is reused. The extra metal that is here for the casting, that will be reused again, it will be remelted, and all of the burnt brick material will be crushed into powder to be used for making the refractory. So, a lot of things get reused. So, in that sense, although it, it, it is slower than an industrial process, it's actually quite eco friendly that it doesn't waste so much of our he was pointing out that some of it goes waste and apparently in this particular one, if you can see what has happened to this side, see, the metal has spilled out because there was a hole, so it didn't get cast properly, that's what happened. Due to the fact that there was some defective hole, sometimes the mold is not perfect like this. We are here on day two, day three of this workshop, Alhamdulillah. And, and now, uh, Gopi Kumar is going to show us how the mold is broken and the plank for making the mirror. Yesterday, we saw the casting process of the mirror plank. You can see here the plank shaft plank. Now, it's going to go for the mold, break over the mold. part to cut out the mirror blank and as you can see here too it is this part which you will use so in the contemporary practice I suppose there is some wastage maybe out of 10 castings uh, at least 4 or 5 of those will be maybe 4 of those will be wasted or effective casting so, but they try to retrieve it as best as they can So here he takes the uh, so he's going to fit this mirror blind into this handle of this side and shape it on the mirror of this side. So you can see the greatest benefit of the 
Brittle it is, you just say this to cut it off with a hammer. So this aloe is almost like dark in its prettiness. Job and this is where my skill as a master craftsman comes in because it cuts into a perfect shape. And as you saw, within 15 minutes, this beautiful oval shape has been achieved. Now, there's a skill in cutting and shaping is something that only the master craftsman is able to do. And then you take the picture of this mirror. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, that we didn't do actually. I'm just here to take fixing of the mirror and the pattern. So, Gopan is going to fix this mirror. Mm -hmm. He heats the mirror blind, and the resin is heated onto which the the wooden mount on which the blind will be polished. So he heats the blind and then puts it on. Blank is set in the resin. And this will be the mount which polishing. This is just plain resin. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mildly hot. Where is the thermal paper? Mm -hmm. No, that's not what you're supposed to do today. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gopan, now you've showed us how this uh, blank is set on the mirror. This, how the mirror blank, 50% in bronze blank, which is silvery by mm -hmm. alloy, is set on this wooden mm -hmm. mount and it's firmed up in resin. Now I have a theory that when you look at some of those sculptures, the Vatsala sculptures and all, that they, they polish something like this itself and they use that as a mirror without putting it in the handle. What do you think of that theory? That it's possible that in the only time they use the blank on the wooden handle. Yes, yeah, but also you can use the in the in the uh, wooden blank. Uh -huh. yeah. That is also possible. Oh, yeah. you. So he seems to support my theory that in the old days the photographs that we see of the Hoysala ladies holding something which looks like a wooden handle with a blank, maybe it was a mirror of this kind. Now we are looking at, I have written in my papers, Journal of Historical Methodology and all that, how in the olden days they probably used a blank like this mounted on a wooden polishing board as a mirror itself. And now you can see how we get this final mirror effect and polish. He's going to polish this on this jute cloth which has got some uh, adhesive and uh, when it's got some polishing uh, materials. 
anybody in a materials laboratory would polish but all the cross lines must go i can still see cross lines cross lines is clear see here he's managed to get most of the cross it's all going one way rather than the other way so that means he's polished it smoothly one way and after all the lines go in one way then i think he moves on to the next step of polishing Uh, this blank it, it gives a very silvery shiny white alloy as you can see and then this blank has to be polished very thoroughly to get a very reflective mirror image you can see here the reflective quality of my saree that it picks up already when in the unpolished state it's brilliant color so you see this wonderful reflective quality of the mirrors Now I want to show this also because I think in olden times, this is the they would have they would have just used a polished mirror like this for you know for the, the sculpture and things like that. They would not have put the brass hand to put sculpture to depiction in dance. Often get sculptures depicting women putting the bikini and taking it to the mirror. Um, actually, what you're watching is a modern sort of process of polishing, where they're using sandpaper uh, and polishing. But actually, in the olden days, they could not have used these polishing cloths; they were using a jute cloth in place. This is a modern innovation that they have to use uh, sandpaper. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is how the mirror is fitted into the fine frame. This is what they finished. Now they are drying out. They have. We can't touch this because it's hot. Basically, this is the handle for the mirror. It was heated here. This mix of uh, there was a. Layer of resin with mixed with soil, which is put in the bag, and then the plank was put on top of it, and it was heated so that it is set. And now it's being left to cool. It's being left to air cool a bit. Now to the one end of the polished layer. and polish it with water, smooth cloths in this direction, up and down, vertical direction smoothly, not hard Finally, this is what the Aranmula Kanadi looks like in its finished state here it's been put into a large brass handle and you see a perfect point in it due to this polishing of the specular bronze alloy and you see this splendid reflection of the greenery of the trees and the leaves inside this mirror. Small wonder then that it's almost called something like a magic mirror and that there's so much of sacred significance because this mirror is also part of the Ashtamangalyam or the eight aus auspicious items which are presented to the Nair bride as part of the wedding trousseau. So this mirror has a lot of uh, symbolic and auspicious associations as well and I think it's wonderful that a fairly high-tech product has been made using a very low-tech methods almost organic and recyclable materials the organic materials of dung pottery everyday materials burnt refractory materials nothing very uh, sophisticated and everything is recycled so it's a very eco-friendly technology in a way and we hope that this craft survives the vicissitudes of change and in an era of globalization already the number of craftsmen are dwindling several of the master craftsmen that I remember meeting when I started here first 20 years ago now in 1991 when I first came to Arunula there were several of the master craftsmen they liked then Janata Nachari, Gopala Krishna Nachari, Arjuna Nachari, and of course, many of them have luckily passed on this tradition to numerous craftsmen, uh, so that it's still surviving in a handful of uh, families and communities. And Gopala Krishna's daughter is also practicing this craft and making Arjuna Valkanadis. 
and uh, with us. But on the whole, we don't know what the fate of this traditional mirror making craft is, given the vicissitudes of change and uh, looking forward to the future.